everybody. Um, calling from the city of Atlanta in the southern United States on what is uh, indigenous Muscogee territory. And I'm really excited to introduce you to these lovely folks. We'll just chat a little bit, uh, share what we're up to, and then we'll open it up for some convo. Um, and yeah, I really also just welcome everyone to come with your video on, even if you're moving around, like move around. Um, you know, they say that bodies in motion soak in information a little better. So feel free to be up and stretching while you're listening to us, making a snack, tending the children, you know, whatever. But we, we'd also love to see you if that's um, an option for you. Hey, Daniela. Um, beautiful. So, and then the chat will be open. So, you know, chat mindfully while speakers are talking and in between speakers are talking. Cool. We, the title of this session is Learning to Be, Unlightenment and Art. Those are capitalized towards liberatory education. We've gonna, we're gonna start with Mark Herbst, who's gonna present about uh, being together somehow and knowing We've got Savine and RJ who are illuminating how to take liberation online, lessons learned from a year of Blue Light Academy. And I will be serving up for your imaginational pleasure a piece called Unlightenment Using Visual Writing Systems for Decolonial Thinking. And we'll each share for about 10 minutes. So welcome in, get comfy, and I'll pass it over to Mark and uh, this is a panel, so I get to read Mark's bio. Mark Herbst is a broadly interdisciplinary researcher, artist, editor, publisher, and sometimes activist whose core experiences are built upon work on the Journal of Aesthetics and Protest, which he co-founded in Los Angeles in the year 2000. I'm about to drop in his info in the chat. You can check him out later. And I'll pass it over to you, Mark. Um. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I wanted, so I titled this being together somehow and um, knowing. Um, and uh, I'm just going to speak uh, offhand about three projects, two of them related to the Journal of Aesthetics and Protest, one um, related to a uh, project that, um, uh, a learning project with kids. Um, being together somehow. Um, most of my work at this point um, is related to the idea that, uh, or reflects the idea and reflects the, the, the facts that when we are um, in relation, we know whether or not we can articulate what it is we know. And that, um, that uh, fact um, is, um, is important to celebrate the practice of being human that we are ecological beings in relation and um, that though i'm not going to be talking about it much that the power of knowledge um, is the power to articulate and to have those truths be accepted as fact by people who account for what is considered smart and knowledgeable actually we'll be talking about that um uh so just a brief introduction yeah, I'm going to jump into a uh, uh, screen share here. Um, do you see this one image? So this is a project um, that I'm currently working with kids um, in Leipzig, Germany, um, where um, it's an adventure playground, the kind of playground that uh, is where kids walk into the playground are given a hammer and nails and are allowed to just start building stuff. Um, with these kids uh, in this playground, we um, uh, built a museum. We asked them to do um, a, a design project to make uh, design, um, models for a museum and then we started building it with them. The museum, um, this is the front entrance, the back, back side is a, like a weird dome made out of cardboard and um, 
would, the front end is you're seeing the ticket booth. Uh, the museum is really open to the wind and the rain. And so when I talk about uh, relation and knowing um, and, and being in relationship, not only to one another, but also to the environment, this museum for me really exemplifies that fact because um, the kids in the museum, um, when they're given the, the role of curators and artists and designers are like, oh, this is fun. I'm going to play with this. And then they suddenly encounter places where they can play ticket booth person and they learn to fill in that role and they learn to argue with one another. Um, they learn, oh yeah, the walls uh, need to be white. Oh, but people are drawing on those walls. How do we regulate those rules or do we need to regulate those rules? Um, the, one of the things that I've been highlighting when I work with them is how much the wind and the rain eat at the structures of the walls. Um, and I point that fact out to talk about the changing environment and to highlight the fact that we are not only in relating to ourselves and playing with rules with one another, we are also building structures in relationship to a, a changing world and a changing world that has very real effects on, um, on their places of play. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna turn that screen share off. This, uh, um, okay. Uh, and go back to this. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about two uh, projects that our journal published. Um, just, this is a beautiful issue eight that I'm not talking about, but I like it. So I just wanted to hold it here. Um, our most recent issue is this one. It's a series of newsletters. It's, uh, uh, we did a submission, uh, open submission call for collectives to anti-fascist or avant-garde collectives to write about uh, their avant-garde practices or anti-fascist practices outside of or beside cultural institutions or political institutions. Cultural institutions like museums and galleries, political institutions like the DSA or, um, or other left political institutions that are moving words um, and practices from the local into forms that are um, ostensibly more political. And uh, as a journal that is a non-institution, that is, we, um, we don't have funding per se, and we don't have a formal structure that we're collectively run, uh, we take it as our role to think about grassroots organizing and grassroots developments of culture, which is always because of how we've been practicing for 20 years outside or beside or beyond institutional force. Um, and so just we, uh, the issue um, back and front cover designed by Josh McPhee, the interior has a few um, intellectual framing essays, but the bulk of it is 19 autonomously edited um, newsletters from locally situated um, anti-fascist or avant-garde collectives uh, from Europe, North America, and Asia. Um, and the, it, we gave them a year to talk with one another about what they are doing and what they're learning outside, um, outside of any kind of force that was going to say, oh, this is good, this is great, this is interesting. We wanted them to stew in their own relationships, in their own sites, to understand what kind of voices and knowledges they're learning and what they need to get down onto the page. Now, with that brief introduction about knowledge that I said before, I found it interesting that, um, yeah, there is access to this project online. Um, I found it interesting, uh, oh, I forgot my point. Um, oh yeah, um, it, so it was worthwhile to think about um, what, what the 19 different collectives chose to articulate because they, um, and it was important that they were collectively um, written because otherwise a human being can say whatever. And as we know, we go through the day with a million different thoughts. Uh, and when I was saying, okay, you're avant-garde, you're anti-fascist, affirming that, but then not really, but then purposefully taking away a political and cultural framework that explains what those are, what those terms mean, 
that the collective's job was to hold each other accountable, not only to the collective, but also to the site of their local practice. Um, so that ideally their words on the page would um, bring them with, from their heads in the sky to wanting to make um, beautiful statements that are distributed internationally as our journal is, to make statements that are perhaps extremely particular, but entirely, um, yeah, entirely embedded in a place. And um, many of the collectives actually didn't do that. They made grand and wonderful statements um, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but um, one of the things that I found really beautiful um, and notable is that one of the, a few of the collectives had um, writing that basically looked like what uh, Devanshi's uh, images on this uh, chat page here. Uh, just a whole mess of text and ideas, which ultimately doesn't do very much, but I wanted to, I wanted to create an editorial space and where, where the space between a site and a being together could be articulated. Um, and I want to move on just to a final book project. Uh, we did this book um, with Pluto Press called We Are Nature Defending Itself about a successful insurrection in, um, on the Zad in France where uh, the Zadistas kicked the French government out of um, their territory for six years, um, stopped the construction of an airport and won the squatters rights to a town. Um, it's an amazing story. I don't have time to get into it. But I wanted to read the, the last paragraph of this forward, and then I'm going to pass it on. Um, the cosmopolitical, the radical, and the radically queer is entangled throughout the rich sociality of all life and its relations. To properly rebalance those entanglements towards something, towards something, something transformative and sustaining is an art and a work for our day. Um, actually, I'm just going to stop it at that. I'll share the rest of the forward um, online. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, the reason why I wanted, we as human beings, I'll just summarize and then um, and pass it on. We as human beings have the capacity to feel and know through massive amounts of knowledge because we are sensing and feeling beings, we feel our relations and we pay attention to what we think is notable. By organizing knowledge socially in different ways, either through the spoken word or just through practicing our being together in new and experimental ways, we have the capacity to change the world because together we bring new things into form um, and new relations into form. Those relations are, new only because we express them as meaningful. Um, they exist already, already. It's just highlighting them as particularly present. That is the radical transformation rather, yeah. So that's, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Ashe, aho. Thanks for the word, Mike. Let's clap it up, snap it up, show Mike a little love. Appreciate you. Beautiful, thank you. Can't wait to put this into conversation with what Savine and RJ are up to. So I'll just keep it moving. If you had questions for Mark, remember them for the question time and or write them down. Um, but I'm gonna pass it over to Savine and RJ um, and read their bios. So RJ is a black, cisgendered father and educator. He fell in love with the pursuit of liberation through education after teaching high school math and then training school teachers in Miami, Florida. He loves sports, music, pondering big questions and spending time with his family, wife Kelly and twins Kai and Jordan. Savine is a white bodied, mad and queer somatic healer, body inquirer, inquirer, inquirer and are a transformative justice educator at Spring Up. 
They believe that the power of justice and liberation is rooted in our bodies and center embodiment, consent, and queer dreaming, love that, as practices of accountability and transformation. Sev loves storytelling, dancing in the wind, consensual tickling, and holding space for questions and wonderings that last into the night. Are you intrigued yet, people? Passing it over to you two. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Is that okay? Okay, cool, cool. Um, let me do that real quick. Okay. Okay. Everyone see my screen? Awesome. Okay. So welcome to Taking Liberation Online, Lessons Learned from a Year of Blue Light Academy. We're going to start with just a little quick grounding. Um, people can't see each other fully because we're sharing screen, but we're going to do a little like quick thing that we do in Spring Up, which is a, like a stretching train at train. So I'm going to start, and if someone else then wants to just unmute themselves, is that possible on this? Um, just unmute yourself and then just share a stretch. And then someone else can also share a stretch, and you can just like mirror whatever stretch feels good. So I can start just like moving my neck from side to side. So you can join me if you want. And if someone else wants to unmute and just share a stretch, then we can all join in together. Maybe one more stretch from someone else. Feel free to just unmute. Fan of yes, <sighs> bring your arms all the way up. Oof, that's so good. It opens up the chest. That's really great. Oh, thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so we're gonna do quick intros. My name is Savine. I use they sev pronouns, and I'm a teaching artist in residence and a coach at Spring Up. My name is RJ, uh, he, him pronouns, calling from Durham, North Carolina, or Eno land. Um, and I also work on the Blue Light Academy over the summer. So we have our Zoom norms for the space. This is something that we like to use in our facilitation and also just our team meetings too. Um, so if you want us to speak slower, you can do it like this. And just for slowing down, um, I tend to speak fast, so just like let me know <laughs> um, if I speak too fast. Then, uh, RJ, do you wanna do you wanna model some of the shorthand in the chat, real quick? So, like, if I'm saying something and you're resonating really hard, you can do the little plus signs in the chat, like that. Um, if you wanna like speak, um, you can put a little asterisk in the chat. Um, and if you agree with something that's said in the chat, you can put like little like like hats in the chat. Um, and then, Archie, do you want to share the other um, Zoom norms? Yeah. Um, and so we talked about uh, slow down. If we need to be louder, we ask people to do this with their hands. Um, and a big reason for doing this, right, is like it's really hard online to follow the chat and everything. So it's helpful to actually see the movement. Um, if we start using jargon, you don't understand, then you can do the jargon giraffe. <laughs> Some people may know it's like the silent coyote. Um, and then also, if there's like an internet problem, um, just kind of put your hand on like to stop, like slow down, like something's going on. You gotta be careful with this one though. Yesterday I was adjusting my screen and then I think people thought that I was telling about internet connection issues. Um, but the reason why, again, we do these norms is really to kind of encourage different types of interaction um, and different types of engagement in the space. Um, and so Seth, could you go to the next slide, please? Totally. Just and also one last thing, just like please use the space, however, that you are in, like however you need or prefer. So you can like move around, you can like um, you can like rock, you can like flap, you can like, you know, turn your screen off if that feels good. Just yeah, use the space however it feels good to you. Great, thank you. So what does school teach us? All right, we just kind of wanted to start with this question. Um, so in this case, I would just give 30 seconds. Just feel free to throw in the chat or if someone feels brave enough to come off mute, but just like, what does school teach us? All right, Brooklyn compliance, obedience, make money. I thought maybe we got like one Pythagorean theorem, but I like competition, how to be a capitalist. Okay, 
So you already know, like a lot of these ideas about like how we kind of move through the world and just what we embody, right, are kind of like instilled in us within starting in schools. So so could you go to the next slide? Thank you for reading the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, my math loving self loves that. Um, but we get a lot of carceral logics from our early schooling. Right. And so it's a lot of points that you already hit on. Right. Like just assuming dependence and incompetence. It's more about control and management is about preparing you for the workforce as opposed to actually like working towards liberation. Right. Or learning just how to be in community together um, about ownership and appropriation of labor, about products and about bodies. And so specifically, um, some of the ways you can kind of see that coming out are going to be on the next slide. And so, oh, let me just make it a larger so I can really read it. Um, <clears throat> but yes, so examples of dominant learning spaces. And I think it's important to spend some time here because what we're doing at Blue Light Academy, which is like the online platform through which we host um, our classes uh, at Spring Up, is we're trying to directly respond to just a lot of the lessons that have been ingrained with us, like the hidden curriculum that happens within schools. So we're thinking about, okay, well, how can we argue against assimilation? How can we get people to understand that like perfectionism is not the way that we want to go, right? It's not about raising your hand, feeling nervous, reflecting on myself, do I have the right answer? But how can we kind of create like different ways of being? How can we get away from paternalism, from saverism? Um, how can we really encourage people to understand that it's not about what the teacher or the facilitator or me right now, whatever I'm saying, but it's just as important as what, what is the knowledge in the community that we're generating in the chat and in the group right now? How can we get away from a fear of open conflict? How can we get away from saying that there's only one right answer, that objectivity is seen as superior? And then also, how can we just really make space for the different ways that people have to show up? Um, I can't remember who it was in the very beginning, but we talked about, right, like, you may, be, you may have a kid right now. You may have animals around you. There may be someone chainsawing a tree right next to you, like, while you're trying to facilitate. And so just thinking about how can we make space the different ways that we show up um, and just knowing that that's okay. And that's actually what we want to be working towards. And so these are some of like the problems or some of the challenges that we're trying to like think about, trying to like solve for. So I'm going to pass it out to Sebs and kind of talk through some of the ways that we do that at Blue Light Academy. So um, why would being an abolitionist org make you have better online engagement? Um, and so the way that we've like just the structured our, our pedagogy and also the way that we've structured Blue Light on, Online Academy is rooted in like what does anti-carceral education and pedagogy look like and how can we allow people to have a space where they can feel as free as possible. So we have a harm response system um, so people can report harm um, that's like happening either like through the Zoom or through the online platform and we respond to harm in a way that really also centers transformative justice um, so people can feel safe but also it's kind of modeling and practicing um, how to, you know, how to have communities of accountability and care that don't rely on institutions um, like the carceral system. And then we also have access for a year. So this is kind of really prioritizing and centering people who have, who like learn at different paces. And so you're able to kind of, you know, learn at your own pace and do whatever feels good to you. So you have like, we have like an, a six week like live kind of space where we have um, um, like office hours once a week. And people can kind of talk and like share in that space, but everything else is kind of asynchronous. But that's still like a six week kind of space where we're live. And then after that, it's like on your own and you can learn however you want. Um, and then also there's a priority in terms of slowing down. So it's really just like asking like, it's like less is more. So the, the material is really like distilled into theories and just questions. And then there's like art and there's all these different multimedia things that are there. So you can kind of choose also what feels good to you in your learning, but also kind of prioritizing like, you can just sit with one question for like eight weeks and that's just enough. If that's what you've determined for you to be your learning for that space, like that is, that is what's important. That's what's great. Um, we also prioritize like community. So we have buddy systems. And so you sign up to a course like with another person and that person is like your buddy for, the, for like the semester or however long you're going to be engaging in this course together. So you're able to like, you know, we encourage you to like ask questions and like go through the prompts together. Um, it's, it's really fun. So people have like brought in their parents with them, which is like amazing. We have a consent and gender and power course and someone brought in their parent and you're like, you're talking about consent with your parent. Like, that's so amazing. So you're spending like six weeks just like engaging and it's probably some really intense conversations, but like, that's where like, 
the changing and the integration is happening. Um, we also have whole, co oh, whole cohorts, cohorts um, sign up together. So it's like 10 people from the same org, with the same movement org, the same like um, just business, like, work, like working together. Um, so in a way it's like, you're able to learn the same things, develop like shared language and like process things together. And then also bring that also to your own, to your own space. Um, and then we also have, yeah, self-guided learning. So that's important too, in terms of just like being able to like center neurodivergent folks. Um, and we have a porous classroom, which we also do with, you know, that goes alongside the buddy system of like, how can your life come into the classroom and how come the classroom go into your life and how can we have that be porous? And then, yeah, emphasis on conversations with yourself and with your community. So kind of what RJ was talking about before, like an emphasis on like, what does it look like to be in right relationship versus being just right? So it's not about like a right or wrong statement. It's about like empathy. It's about storytelling. Um, let me move my little face. Yes, while you're doing that, just to add, Mark, I, I heard a connection to what you were sharing before. Right, just in terms of our the focus on common conversations in the communities, right? Like the power and the experience and the knowledge comes from us being together and from the shared experience. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm just like a really like to kind of hammer in the connection between the two uh, comments. Yeah, totally. Um, and then also, I wanna I wanna uplift what you said, RJ, in the chat in terms of like. We start the class by sharing that it's not about if harm will happen, but rather it's when. And we use the harm response system as a way to elevate, yeah, the way we respond to harm as a community. So we're like planning for harm to happen in the space so then we can respond to it in a way that is generative. Um, and so, yeah, other things that for us help us build like learning liberatory spaces are embracing difference and generative conflict. So yeah, that's part of the like harm will happen. How do we embrace that conflict and how we like lean into it? Um, storytelling, so it's, um, you know, speaking from your eye, from I, so speaking from your own life and being specific and being like context specific too. Um, mistakes are teachers and normal. Um, differentiation and multiple equivalent options. And so, yeah, like we have podcasts, we have music, we have somatic videos, we have like text, we have, what else do we have? So many things. And it's like all the different things and you can learn all these different ways. Um, and we focus on values and relationships and personal goals over rules and directions. And so at the beginning of the course, we ask like, what, what does success look like for you? And what can you do to meet that goal for yourself? Um, and then we have like this, like pretty much like choose your own adventure thing. So people have their own like success goals and they just kind of get to pick and choose and like go through this thing with their buddies and figure out what feels good to them. Um, and then we also also have coaches too alongside that can help you integrate these things too. Um, yeah, then we have somatics and play. Um, we just embrace like different different language and different like cultural ways of like um, going through language and like talking about things too. And so it's pretty much just like a, what is your story? Like what, what narratives are you looking to change? And what, what resources and what platforms can we provide that can help you like, yeah, shift and change those things for yourself? RJ, is there anything else you'd wanna add? Uh, the only thing I would say is just to kind of double down on the, the self-determination. Um, for me, it was, it was and continues to be really difficult at times to transition away from like traditional education and having like set learning objectives for everybody, right? And it really just requires a, a level of trust um, and belief in your community for them to really set like their own learning objectives and determine how to move forward. And then I saw, I think either Carolina or Carolina, um, how do you nurture these when a student has ingrained colonial and neoclassical perspectives? So I think, I mean, that's, that's a really good question, right? I think that's something that we face a lot. And so I think it kind of goes, in some ways, it kind of touches on some of the self-determination, right? Like we're talking about there's going to be harm because we know that we're all raised in the society and we have these systemic ideas ingrained in us. And so we don't expect everyone to have like quote unquote, well, there is no right answer, right? But we also know that people are going to respond based on their previous experiences and their previous knowledge. And so that may lead to then some conflicts. It may lead to Seb saying something that actually creates a response within me. And so that's why then we have the focus on somatics, while we have the coaching that goes alongside of it. Because again, it's not trying to, what I learned growing up was like, let's just avoid talking about that and it'll make it go away. It's instead like being ready and prepared for when it does happen. So then we can support the community as we move, as we move through it.
Um, this is a student reflection that I thought really spoke well to the kind of just like the experience of what it could be like to, to go through this. Um, and so at the end of the, of the course, we have like, it's not mandatory. You can just submit a reflection if you want and it can be whatever you want. It can be like a dance video. It can be a poem. It can be like a zine. It can be whatever. Um, and this, um, this quote, I'll have to move my, you know, you have all the different things on the screen. I can't fully read them. Um, but yeah, so the container and culture this course um, sat in was just as impactful as the course content. Grounding exercises to prepare your body for the content, expectation setting before the first week, emphasis on re-emphasis that completing content is not a requirement nor a prerequisite to attend office hours. Poems, music, creative writing as learning content, community composed of organizers who can empathize with each other. Um, so I remember reading that being like, oh, like, yeah, damn, like that is like, that feels like, really kind of encapsulated what it what it feels like to be in that space. I was a teaching artist for uh, two courses in the summer and the fall. And I feel like for me also, like it, that's just also what I feel in this space too. It's not just, I don't feel like it's just participant. It's like, I felt like that. I feel like I'm engaging with the comments. I'm learning, I'm asking questions, I'm figuring this out. And I feel like for me, like that was also one of like a beautiful thing for me feeling like it really just is about like your own relationship to what's happening and to the resources and to the work. Um, so yeah, um, and then yeah, I guess what is next, RJ, if you wanna. Yeah, so we can just kind of close out with just um, a few plugs. So one of the things we do in terms of also differentiation is just different ways to engage. Um, this summer, we're gonna launch our first liberatory education course. That's gonna be over the summer. So if you're interested, um, you just put it in the chat. Uh, you can see the link there, though, uh, at our Blue Light Academy. We also have a workbook for all of our courses, whether it's transformative justice, consent, gender, power, liberatory education. We have a course and we have an accompanying workbook. Um, we also have a Patreon community. And so that's if people are more interested in just continuing community outside of um, the formal spaces, coaching. And so if anyone's a Patreon at above $5 uh, per month, they receive the liberatory education workbook. Our social media is here. And then upcoming events. Um, we're having a few retreats, I'm just going to find them, uh, a few retreats coming up about liberatory facilitation, which is going to be on in two weeks, so that'll be March, I think, 11th and 12th, um, and then also one for harm systems design on March 25th and March 26th. Um, so if you're interested, please feel free to ask some questions at the end of this space. Um, and yeah, Lin uh, Linnea, Linnea, I'm not sure, but uh, has been dropping some helpful links in, uh, in the chat. Yeah, thanks so much. And we'd love to just close our time, which is a one word check in. If someone, people just want to type in the chat or unmute yourself, just like how you're feeling. Um, yeah. Any, any just one word check in. I don't know about y'all, but I'm feeling um, energized. Excited, excited, and hopeful, relieved, bouncy. Love that curious, thankful. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Sabine and RJ. Let's give some claps and snaps for their presentation. That was lovely. I have questions. I'm going to save them for the question comment section. Um, we've got one more and we have been talking at you. So real quick before I start sharing if you feel comfy i'll invite you to just get up and do like a little shake out let some of that knowledge like imagine like it just like went into your zoom face and it's like <laughs> dripping down lower 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 into your belly maybe a little belly jiggle because our bellies are always so tight and a little hip shake feeling our feet on the ground maybe a little noise from your mouth <laughs> Cool. You can keep doing that, y'all, while I'm talking. I would even love that. Um, but uh, we're going to, yeah, I'm going to close this up with um, a last presentation, and then we'll have time for some chats. I'm going to share uh, my screen. OK, can y'all see that? up present okay here we go so i'm going to talk about visual writing systems 
Um, I'm a scribe, or some people know it as um, graphic recording. Um, there we go. Um, so what that means is I go to meetings, conferences, gatherings, and as conversations are unfolding amongst groups, I'm sort of trying to pull some of that wisdom from the conversation into a map so that we can have uh, visually what we're talking about. Everybody knows that when you cross languages, you get more nuanced meanings from things. And so my whole thing is that writing visual writing systems as they're emerging through graphic recording and um, through other writing systems in a contemporary way. Um, I'm trying to do some rooting into where they come from because you know, we've got emojis, we've got like social media, you know, little like teaches on the uh, Instagram stuff. We're just becoming more of a visual, there's more visual writing happening. And I, I want to ground that in a decolonial context is kind of my thing. So I'm going to give an example. I've been starting to learn Nahuatl, which is an um, indigenous language from Mexico um, of some of my ancestors. And Nahuatl was written in pictures, in carvings, in the architecture. It was not an alphabetic. It was a spoken language that was never written in an alphabet. And there's a reason for that. And so Tlaltecutli is a good example. Tlaltecutli means Earth Lord. And as that deity got translated into Spanish and then English, we see a lot that that, that deity gets translated as earth goddess or earth mother because the earth was sort of um in other parts of the cosmology considered as a sort of feminine realm um but that's that's inco incongruent with the language and one of the reasons why visual writing was useful for um, that cosmology is because visuals visuals create a more flexible cosmology it's possible to have a complex gender system when the writing, the symbol for that being is an image that doesn't necessarily have to come with a pronoun. So, um, like I said, Plaquilos were the people who were, it was their role to be um, scribes and they were painters. They were um, a part of ritual and ceremony. They're, um, they were record makers of, of the Nawa cosmology. That was a lot, um, part, of their, part of their work was to make record of a cosmology that was complex and um, flexible in the way that people understood things. So um, fast forward past sort of, you know, 200 years of uh, what we know as colonization and genocide and my field of people of practitioners who are writing practitioners are like you know we just invented this new visual writing system um which is kind of the hallmark of the or the blueprint the genetic blueprint of colonization right is like erase something um and then come back and and claim that you've discovered it so for for scribes and for any for scribes, artists, people who are just note taking or people who are interested in knowledge production via um, like collective practices, right? So like how we make knowledge together. I think it's important to just kind of name that there were dozens and dozens and dozens of pre-colonial languages and some that still are intact today that used visual writing systems as legitimate forms of knowledge production. And so when we're talking about text, when we're talking about knowledge, you know, moving outside of the sort of Western understanding that knowledge gets produced in books, it gets, it comes out of um, academia. Um, th this kind of like anchors us in like, no, we produce knowledge by like the ways that we embroider our fabric or the patterns that we paint um, or how we construct our houses. And we can, we can develop literacies to be reading one another. We can read our bodies, we can read our clothing because everything is a language. Like Mark was saying, it, it, it's, it's been flattened um, 
but there is there are like a massive amount of ways that we're generating creating knowledge and so in order to do that to be creating new not only creating new knowledge but creating new epistemologies of how we know things um, in a contemporary way i think it's really important to just tell the truth about what has happened and all of the indigenous cosmologies and epistemologies that have been erased okay that's my little soapbox um, so for folks who want to be practicing this, maybe you're a doodler, maybe you, uh, you know, got to get on the mic sometimes, maybe you, you don't draw at all, but we all speak metaphorically, we speak in symbols, we speak in, in language as well. My sort of, you know, invitations are um, start listening from an embodied way deeper than words. How do you listen to people communicating through their feeling for them, sensation, intuition, dreams, um, five senses and beyond. And then another practice that I invite is to write decolonially. So some of those beautiful um, things that um, Sabine and RJ shared from Temo Kuhn, right? Like the sort of like cultural norms that get erased. How do we how do we listen to a group and create knowledge together and share that knowledge back to people that's not looking to control or master information or consider people as resources or even consider the earth as resources? You know, how can we be um, showing back like what we're listening and then reflecting it back in a sort of like participatory process um, in a way that's decolonial? And for the 10 minutes that we have together, I'm gonna to focus on the, down, the second point of distributing resource. This is a kind of somatic piece that I've learned from being a somatic practitioner around distribution as a sort of like what to do when things get too intense or what to do when there's, you know, we're kind of, our society is now organized because there's hoarding of resources, power. And so distribution is almost always a useful way to be working <coughs> with imagery. So when you're working with imagery, placing challenges in relationship to resource can help create flow as people get to see back what their processes are. Um, identifying challenges that are too large for the group to metabolize and inviting external resources to support that. And inviting people, identifying people in points where resources blocked or stuck and, and just visualizing flow. So you know, that could look like drawing big streaks, that could look like arrows, it can be super, super simple. So I'll give a little example of a piece that I did with a group um, about a year ago. This group was trying to change the world, y'all, and um, had a whole lot of challenge in it. So right away, um, talking about transformation, I drew them these giant snakes because snake medicine from the lineages that I've studied is a, is a symbol of transformation, how the snakes shed their skin. There are indigenous people in the room and they introduced um, the space with this, with this saying that means hello other self as, as their greeting. So I put that right in the middle um, to center our conversation around it. Um, on the left, you can see I wrote B, 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 fix, fix, do, 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 do. And that was because the conversation kept going back to the same, same piece around like, we have to do more, we have to do do things different, we have to change things in action. And there was, there was a need to talk about being. Um, and so I just put that over and over and over again. Um, I'll do another one here. This is the next day. So there was a lot of tightness on the first day. So I opened this up with some giant strokes across the page to open up some flow in my body and, and in the cultural body. I started putting in these little roots that could weave some of the ideas together. There were people there from policy and from the private sector and from government and, um, and, and they needed to be woven together. Um, the bees I put in really big, that was an example of like bringing in some external resources of when the conversation was like, how do we do this? And like, what do we need? What kind of like, what will it take for us to do this? The bees were just like the ways that bees live communally in a hive, everyone with a role, um, 
the way that they dance as communication was just like the metaphor that like opened up um, resource to support that, that process. So um, I have one more and I'll just invite you all to pop open, like take your mics off and, and see what you notice in terms of what are the resources that you see in this image and what might some challenges be that you see in this image and how might they be talking to one another. Um, feel free to write it in the chat or uh, open your mic and share out loud. Yeah, so crystals in the corner, human touch, those were resources. Yep, healing hands. Yeah, and there was a lot of flow in this room. So so that was more of a reflection in this conversation than it was like what I sort of assessed was a need. Mm -hmm. I love the magnifying glass and then the scissors and dismantling the nation state. Were it to be so easy, right? <laughs> Somehow visually now it's possible. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah, and I also just as a, as a as another piece, I work with the color black a lot because of um visually I think that the color black gets um really entangled with anti-blackness at least in the United States. Although um, I'm sure that happens in other parts of the world. And so it's important to me to visually put black in my, in my pieces that show um, um, beauty and the mystery of what can't be known in the light and the expansiveness and the, the, the importance of, um, of darkness and not just um, using that as a color that denotes something that's bad or shadowy or, or yeah so we've got we've got that in the, the figure on the left that says I am spirit embodied and then some of the treasures that exist in the darkness in the left corner well I want to leave time for us to chat so I will close out there um thank you to everyone who presented Mark Savine RJ thanks for everybody who's uh, here, sticking with us. And uh, let's open up for question, comments, noticings, maybe some weavings. We could, we could weave some of the pieces. Um, yeah, kicking it over to whoever wants to pick up the talking piece. You want to tell us about it, Mark? Oh, you just muted yourself. Okay. Um, yeah, no, my question is, um, I, it's really such wonderful to share this space with um, you, all of you. Um, I'm, so I live in Europe right now and um, I've been, we started our journal collectively 20 years ago and within um, my generation I find so much of the knowledge and the work that um, that uh, we do to be um, yeah marginal knowledges and and it's wonderful to kind of to hear how much deeper social and knowledge-based practices are than, um, uh, uh, yeah. And so I'm like, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm just curious how you 
I'll describe and understand your communities um, where this practice practices because I guess for me, I spent years trying to to develop this these sort of discourses and it's wonderful to hear what you guys are doing and I'm like whoa where 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 are your practices tell me about your communities what is uh, yeah I'm just so it's both an appreciation and a, and a and a, yeah and a question if anybody wants to take on how you see the worlds and what are the challenges I guess also I guess yeah, what 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 resonances you find in communities and in things that and in conflicts that you're yeah, it's an open question, but awesome. I can I can take a first attempt at it. I think that for us at Spring Up, um, your point about the community, that's that's a huge part of like the end game, right? It's, it's just realizing that it's too much for any one person or any small groups of people to do. And so a lot of what we think about is like moving to intentional responses, right? And just knowing how community accountability, how can we like work together, like as community moving forward. So I do think that whether it is a literature education course over the summer, or it's more of like a workbook that someone's getting about transformative justice, we are through our work and through Blue Light Academy, trying to find ways to grow community. Um, and I think actually like the pandemic was a good impetus to kind of push us in more into like the virtual space, right? And then just thinking, hey, well, what can we do now if we can, if we don't have to be like physically in the same space? Um, so I don't know, I mean, I, I would ask the same question to other people, but I do think like just the idea of community and seeing that as like a really worthwhile goal that we're building towards is very important to us. I have just a comment. Um, I work in, I facilitate online with a group of tweens and we embody a lot of the, your list. Um, I can't remember which slide it was, but it resonated in all, everything on the list and how it's um, in like the deep values. And one of the things that kept coming to mind and how that plays out in a practice is like this, you know, a lot of patience and flexibility and then I also thought about like as a facilitator with youth being like a like holding a, like a barrier of all of those like expectations of capitalist society, you know, perhaps their parents or other pressures and being able to kind of be a filter to protect the participants from that kind and to build the community beyond um, those conventional goals and values. So I'm not sure. That's just some thoughts I had, Mark, on what I do and how it relates. And where, where are you working, Brooklyn? I work for an online program called The Hub Micro Academy right now. And I'm working on a self-directed art, art program to come out in the spring. I have a question um, for Savine and RJ about the use, the choice of the word academy, and maybe for you too, Brooklyn. Um, and I feel like it kind of points to a lot of the questions that in universities um, were sometimes like throwing around around whether or not transformative education can happen within within the the dominant system. And so, like, just really curious about that word because it's been present for me these last few days. I didn't choose the name and <laughs> I, I was just hired. Um, I, I think that it's a way to like a doorway into to like for people who may not be comfortable in other ways. So sometimes I feel like we're kind of speaking in a schoolish code to try to like let people feel comfortable enough to come into liberatory spaces. And then they're like pleasantly surprised by what they find. Like, how did this happen? And we're like, oh, I just like let them be free. Oh. Hey y'all, um, we are also from Blue Light Academy over here. So we can address some of those questions. I was thinking about, so a fun fact is that we originally were gonna call it Spring Up School. <clears throat> but then we realized that the shorthand would be SUS. 
and that it would seem really suspect. <laughs> and so we were like, oh, that doesn't seem right. Um, and then we were really talking about it and trying to figure out, it was at the same time that we were figuring out our branding and just like the right fonts and just how did we want to share not only as far as words, but like aesthetically what the nature of the community is. And part of what, so us as a group, many of us are queer and trans, mad, disabled, and really think about the nature of like reclaiming language as empowering and like re, uh, like us in community having the ability to redefine what words mean. And um, just this idea that for us to claim to be an academy as a way for folks to be able to recognize the legitimacy of the um, ideas that we're putting out there. Cause you know, we've been doing this in community for the last 10 years. And a lot of people have had a hard time knowing how to cite us, how to communicate what they were learning from us within more formal academic environments in ways that were really challenging. Honestly, we had some people really like reappropriate ideas that we had shared in ways that we did not feel good about within their academic research and really thinking about like, what are the ways that you name the information that you're putting out there in a way that is citable, but also accessible. Um, and we really just like this idea many of us were intrigued as, you know, millennials by uh, Hogwarts and all of these kind of like magical uh, fairy schools that are kind of uh, <laughs> kind of like little oasis in the woods. And we were like, how do we convey that idea digitally? And when we found this font that we use, um, we were really excited about the idea of having it be almost like this magical uh, queer uh, reclamation of the idea of an academy um, being like an oasis. Cause many of us found, found ourselves really within kind of our rejection of school, but our love of knowledge. And so how do we create an environment in a digital space, both aesthetically through language and as a community that can reclaim that language um, in an intentional way and can also be cited and acknowledged within academic institutions. Um, and so a fun fact is that uh, the two of us who originally founded the, the org um, were in a co-ed fraternity in college <laughs> and we lived in the house and part of the um, invitation into the fraternity um, was that basically the house had been this uh, pretty problematic Greek house on campus that was really banning people and didn't feel good and so they banished that Greek house and they reclaimed it as this place called the Tabard and what they said was that there was this intergalactic toad that followed a blue light to earth to the darkest place in 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 the world and created this little oasis within this horrible campus that was guided by the blue light. And so that's why we decided to call it Blue Light Academy was inspired by um, that fraternity that we were a part of and kind of this idea of we hated our campus, we hated our school, we thought everyone was like the worst ever, but this co-ed fraternity when we were all kind of doing weird shit was really great and was really inspiring to us. And we felt that um, reclaiming that blue light as well as kind of reinterpreting the framework of academy would be a way for us to be able to share that with people in, in a digital space. So yeah, that's where, that's where the title Blue Light Academy came from. Thanks for asking. Love it, darling. I just want to say that we're at time and we can take a few more minutes, but for folks who have to go, big gratitude, much love, stay in touch with Ecoversities. Um, and oh, can... and real quick, before you hop out, I'll put our uh, feedback form in the chat. We've got some upcoming sessions, more awesomeness to jump into. So uh, I would love it if you, um, it's only four questions. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question for you, Kate, um, but I'm happy to, you know, wait if people who need to step out want to ask another question. I'd like to leave also an open question. My open question, I'm, I'm curious, like, um, because my practice is so much around non-institutions and stuff that doesn't get institutionalized. Um, and I, th my open question would be, um, yeah, I, I am generally curious about in your practices and in your world, what, what is the dynamic between knowledges that do find academic form or, or professional forms and what are those practices that don't? Um, yeah. 
especially in the in the understanding of the wider ecologies of what what produces and what what is a what is a meaningful community that can hold knowledge um and so in terms of the economies libidinal social and actual money-based economies that allow for ongoing and sustained exchanges um yeah and that's that's so I'm, that that's the open question i have and ways in which those actual institutional forms allow for or disallow for the continuation of those meaningful community economies over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sam, you want to stack your question and then we can play? Yeah. So my question is, I'm, I would love to hear a story um, of a moment when like the visual language um, spoke back to the space you were um, kind of interpreting for and the shifts that happen in the space. Mm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. See you, Carla. Yeah, I'm trying to think of an example that touches on Mark's question too. Um, Yeah, so, okay. So Mark, I, I I so I love I love what y'all were sharing at Spring Up around and Brooklyn too around like using language that's intelligible and then in, like drawing people into your own world. And I think that uh I tend to play at the edges where uh, like eros and the, and the erotic, which is just to say like what sort of makes us feel alive, like what brings us alive. Um, I'm in favor of not institutionalizing that and rather than drawing that into something that's a structure um, that like doesn't really belong in institutions, um, like maintaining a sort of like wildness for, for that. And, um, and so, there's so there's that piece and then there's the piece about most of my work pre penny being in like hotel ballrooms you know with no windows and like the ugliest fucking carpet and just like the like super anti erotic spaces um and so you know since since then my work is online and 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 that's 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 its own thing too but um yeah i think that the 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 imagery when people when people are listening conversations sort of happen in a line right there's like linear time you can only say one thing at a time you can only listen to one person at a time and when you translate that to an image suddenly something that happened in the morning sits next to something that happened in the afternoon and they get to kind of live their own lives together and so when i when people would come up to me throughout a conference and and be like, what are you up to? Like, what is this little side circus shit? And, you know, no people were friendly about it, but they're just like, what is this? You know, I could really kind of like weave relational stories about some of the characters that get thrown up, some of the, some of the, you know, I was always putting like plants and stuff in the, in um, pictures because, you know, the ballroom, people are talking about, you know, like futurity and like where we're going in inside of the structures of these like really dusty old systems. And so, so, so for me to be able to come and like, like breathe life into those and like be like, you know, what future, like what future is not this, it's not what this conversation, where this conversation is happening, but it can be on the actual earth. That would, that, that's, that's one way that telling a story not only visually but almost like I'm your like naturopath I'm not a naturopath but culturally you know I'm I'm reading the 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 cultural body and being like oh girl you need more vegetables or like you're not hydrated enough and and giving that to people visually shifts what's possible as the conversation continues on to unfold. So lovely, it's a super lovely, lovely. lovely. <laughs> it's 
it's a super social art. It never happens with, with just one body. It has to happen in a group. I really appreciate that. And I really feel like, yeah, just like being able to just like queer time, you know, and like create that kind of space where people are able to like just interact with something they said before too. And like, cause also I think that's also the part too of like, I can, I can change as a person in like an hour, you know? So it would look like, look like to like look back at something that, that was said um, and like, yeah. And like re and reform a different relationship with it too. So I, I love that. I love that. Like, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That's God, that's like my dream, right? It's like, and that's such a cool thing about about trans people is like we were willing to sort of like just rename ourselves and completely start a new identity when our older versions of ourselves were just like completely insufferable because we were in conditions that didn't allow our thriving. So like for an image to be not useful to the group anymore by the end of the session because they have grown out of the story that they started telling themselves. Like that's my, when that happens, I'm like so delighted. <laughs> um, I had another, if we just, you know, I can go to like another couple minutes, but um, I didn't, you know, I was curious what the ages are of your learners and your um your yeah of who's who's in your community and and who kind of tends to show up to your spaces i can share i actually don't know what the youngest age is but the ages have tended to be like 20s 30s but above too um as i'm saying there's parents there's like elders in the space so yeah yeah i don't know rj if you know what the youngest age is of someone um, I don't. I, I know that. I mean, so spring up, uh, we started I've been doing a lot of like kind of in person youth development and like youth organizing. So in blue light, it's only uh, it's, it's kind of weird to believe it's only been a year. But yeah, uh, so I think like that's one thing we're definitely thinking about just kind of, yeah, what does it mean to kind of bring in and have to be accessible for different ages um, in different um, places. I know that we were, we had quite a few people from a few students from Europe and then we also had a few students I think from the Philippines last year so we're also thinking about like how can we kind of expand like internationally uh, and what would it mean to make it accessible to different people different context I work with kids the youngest is nine and the oldest is 14 so it's like a mix all, all those ages together in the same group twice a week for like four hours at a time And we're just like learning and exploring together outside of a specific theme, or if there's a theme, it's one that we're create co-creating together. I work with refugee kids from like age three to 12. And a lot of that is just mostly giving them space to be with one another. <laughs> in ways that are calm <laughs> which means to listen and know that somebody's listening to them while they're playing with their conflicts with one another yeah that if that question about parental consent forms i assume so the the founder of the organization handles the admin part and like the consent forms with the parents and the legal stuff so i don't have to yay but i i assume that that's how it's all handled but I, maintaining a culture of consent is our role as facilitators so the parents agree that you know everything is know that everything is consensual within the program i'm i'm happy to see that there's so many uh so many of us here thinking about intergenerational learning spaces i think that's something that has been a theme across ecoversity's conversations for many years as the organization or a, as a network that started as 
folks reimagining higher education and and that obviously gets blurry as we pull school out of uh, buildings and back into the fabric of our lives where there are children and there are elders and there are um, many generations in the community. So I love, I love that these conversations are, are alive in, in this, in this uh, season for us. Thank you.